Ken Hoven is fond of saying, he starts off his lecture by saying that he believes the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. Well, my name is Ken Hoven. I taught high school science for 15 years. And I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. I would say I love the Bible. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. Okay, let's see about that. Ken, taking the Bible literally. Are we still taking the Bible literally? Let's look at these scriptures right here. Isaiah 34, 4. And all, how many? All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And how many? All, All their hosts shall fall down. Huh? We have Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, saying, and I believe quoting Isaiah, and the stars of heaven shall fall. How many of them? All. If he's taking Isaiah as his source, we see that Peter says that the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. And then we see in Revelation, the prophetic scripture again, John is saying now that the stars, how many of them? all fell to the earth. All the stars are going to fall to earth. I take the Bible literally. It's scientifically accurate. Really? Well, okay. Let's think about that. We've got some big trouble if Beetlejuice is headed our way, followed by Arcturus and the constellations. Okay? Big problems. You know, they say this is a galaxy, right? And all those points of light are suns and with planets going around them. And all that's headed our way? Andromeda is headed our way. And oh, by the way, there's supposedly billions of those out there too. All of that is coming to this place right here. Somebody's lying. I am not prepared to say that it's Isaiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, Peter, and John. I'm going to go with, you know what, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Michio Kaku, et al., you guys are lying. Somebody's lying. Taking the Bible literally? I don't know. Part six, the bottom line. What does the Bible actually say? Well, I've been going through a lot of it, but here's a whole lot more. According to all the texts that you see on the screen, we live in a self-contained three-tiered system. Heaven, earth, and the underworld. There is a solid firmament dome vault over us according to all those texts you see there people who believe that the bible teaches a spherical earth remember you have two scriptures <laughs> two and we already showed you they don't work meanwhile Yahuwah's throne sits above the heavens the waters according to all the texts that we see there the earth is inscribed as a circular flat fashion onto something with four corners and surrounded by water according to all the texts that you see there the sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament, and all the stars are going to fall to earth, according to the text that you see there. There are floodgates, windows in the firmament, according to the text that you see there. The earth is a geocentric, stationary world set on pillars, according to all the text that you see there. So, what we find, from Genesis to Revelation, the earth is consistently described by Holy Spirit authors as fixed and not moving, spinning, orbiting, etc., Circular with edges, corners, pillars, foundations, etc. Under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. Again, I ask, which do you think is a better model, a better fit for a stationary world set on a firm foundation of pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed? They move and which all, will accommodate all the stars falling to earth. Which model fits these descriptions better? Again, as I said earlier, those who disagree with me, you got two. Isaiah's circle and Job's hangs the earth on no thing. That's right. He didn't hang the earth on anything. It's set on pillars. <laughs> you see that over and over and over again. So in the end, your only choice is to write the whole thing off as poetry. Allegorical figures of speech and or default to the doctrine of accommodation. And that brings us to the final part of this presentation. Part seven. Christians, creationists, and pastors need to stop making excuses to explain why they simply do not believe what the Bible actually says. Now, what I hear from people all the time, especially people who don't agree with what I'm saying here, is, Rob, you're making Christians look stupid. Have you guys heard that before? This is making Christians look stupid. Okay, if that's your big concern, right? if that's what you're so concerned about, I'm going to help you out here. All right, uh, here's a news flash for you. We already look stupid. <laughs> to pretty much everybody else out there that don't believe the same way we do. I mean, here are just a few of the crazy things we already believe in. A six-day creation. They tell us we've, the universe is almost 14 billion years old. To say that it was created in the six literal days, completely absurd. We believe in two magic trees, a talking snake, 
Moses split the Red Sea with a staff that used to be a snake that could eat other staffs that turned into snakes. Interesting, a dude with a talking donkey like on Shrek. The walls of Jericho come tumbling down, the trumpet blasts. Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. Wow, that's pretty crazy. The length of a man's hair gave him superhuman strength. See, I'm growing my hair out. <laughs> a few guys chilling out in a fiery furnace, remaining unharmed. A dude spends three days and three nights inside a fish, then gets out and starts preaching. Here's a big one for you. A savior, born of a virgin, who walked on water, did miracles, died, rose again in three days, hung out for a few more weeks, then flew up into the sky like Superman with the promise of returning on a flying horse followed by a floating city. <laughs> there are a lot more that I just couldn't fit on one slide. Okay? So if your big concern is looking stupid, <laughs> you know, just embrace the madness. <laughs> okay, guys. This is all stuff we have no problem claiming that we believe. Floating axe heads, all kinds of stuff, right? Okay, so to everybody else, we already look stupid, all right? What did I show you yesterday? What they believe is infinitely worse. Don't be intimidated by these people. <laughs> what they believe is way worse than what we believe. Oh, and by the way, you know, there's a few other things. Uh, charismatic wackiness, holy laughter, prayer cloths, and angel feathers and stuff like that. You know, big hair, gaudy makeup people that aren't doing us any favors. <laughs> Televangelists and all that stuff. Uh, how about this? Numerous failed rapture predictions that the Bible guaranteed. The Bible guaranteed it's going to happen. How many of those have we had? Yeah, we have no problem looking stupid, all right? So let's just get rid of that argument. And I would suggest that when we grossly mangle what the scriptures clearly state to force them into saying and supporting things they do, that they do not, this also makes us look really stupid. Regardless, you have nothing to fear. Again, if you really want to look at stupid, look at what the other side believes. Now, metaphors, similes, poetry, and figures of speech. Problems with these excuses. Even with metaphors, similes, and figures of speech, truth is still conveyed. We say things like strong as an ox, right? We all understand that. That's a truth. It's, it's, oxes are strong as this figure of speech, so that works, you know. Stretched out like a tent. Hmm, we know what tents look like, a structure set up over a flat surface. Take a left at the fork in the road. We get that one. It's kind of an interesting story, though. Sometimes idioms don't always translate across multiple cultures. When I was in India, um, I, I was talking with uh, some of my translators, and we were going to another village, and I, and I said, yeah, we're going to be down here. When you get to the fork in the road, take a left, right? And the dude didn't show up. It, was like, it took forever. We're like, what happened to you, man? And he was actually out there looking for a fork. <laughs> that got lost in translation somehow. Like, he, he's looking for a utensil. <laughs> and I'm going, wow, man, okay, all right. Some things don't translate. <laughs> uh, even poetic language, whenever we're using poetic language, truth is still conveyed, right? Let's try it. Roses are red, violets are blue. You just read poetry, yet it's still true. Get it? Oh, it's all poetic language. Does that nullify truth? It's still true. Then we have this one. I love this one, the doctrine of accommodation. Generally speaking, the principle of the doctrine of accommodation is that God has chosen to reveal aspects of himself to humanity in a way which humanity is able to understand. That's a kind way of putting it. I think this is more accurate right here. Doctrine of accommodation. Okay, here's the deal. Since you are too stupid to understand, some of my, some of my word will be true, but some will be made up so you idiots can have some idea what I mean. However, you won't know what is true and what's not. Never mind, just trust me. That's essentially what the doctrine of accommodation boils down to. <laughs> there are major problems with this doctrine. First, it makes you out as a liar or an accomplice of lies. Second, it nullifies divine inspiration. And third, it tosses out any notion of biblical inerrancy. We teach things like the Bible is inerrant and true. Well, how can it be if it's clearly showing something stupid that's not true? This is what drives me crazy about the people at Logos Bible Software and Dr. Michael Heisler in particular. He has a very articulate presentation of showing what the Hebrew cosmology is. Makes a wonderful case what the words mean, what it is, and shows that that picture there is basically that, not basically, that is the conception that they had uh, of cosmology. 
And then he turns around and then gives all the reasons why he personally does not believe it because he says, they didn't have a scientific worldview, we do. Okay, you just called God a liar. You just nullified inerrancy. Which sacred cow are we going to hold on to? <laughs> you know, either the Bible's true or it's not. You can't say that it's t teaching falsehood, you know, and is still inerrant. It doesn't work. So, seems to me a choice needs to be made. If the spinning heliocentric globular model of our world is true, then divine inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture is demonstrably false, and all such notions must therefore, of necessity, be forever abandoned. So which sacred cow are we willing to let go of in order to maintain our beliefs? You can't have both. Either the Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures are accurate and true, or they are not. It's that simple. Which one are we going to believe? I don't know about you, but I say, you know, as for me and my house, let God be true and every man a liar. <laughs>